All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're kind of taking a different approach than usual, and uh, we're making a traditional Bach, German lager, uh, but I'm using uh, basically all of the leftover ingredients that I have available to me to try and make a beer out of it. Uh, what's going on right now, if you can't hear from my nasal voice, is uh, I've managed to avoid COVID for two years, but uh, it finally got me. So despite being fully vaccinated and all that good stuff, so I've been sitting in my place doing what I have to do. I went through all of the uh, malts that I currently have on hand, my hops, my yeast, and I decided that the best thing I can make, given the ingredients I have right now, is a traditional Bach. Um, I'm not gonna do it traditionally though, uh, because I'm kind of tapped on energy right now, uh, so I don't have the green screen set up, I don't have too much else kind of planned for the day, but I figured I'd go ahead and make a grain of glass video about it anyway, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Fortunately, I did not lose my sense of smell or taste, so traditional Bach is basically one of the stronger German lagers out there. Um, usually they come in around 6%, uh, so it's not really a very strong beer by today's standards, but it was back in the day when it was made. The word Bach means goat in German, or ram, actually, I think. Um, and it kind of became associated with the dark, strong beers of Einbeck, Germany. Uh, and eventually those beers made their way down to Munich, where we kind of know them more so today. The Bach is a pretty enduring style. It hasn't really seen some, too much change over the years. Domestically, the easiest version to acquire is probably Shiner Bach. Um, which is not really the best example, I would say. Uh, it's really not a bad beer, and it actually was brewed by German immigrants. My personal favorite is Eyinger Bach, which you should be able to find pretty easily if you have a decent beer store near you. Uh, so today's recipe, though, it, like I said, kind of threw it together. I went through all my stuff and figured out what I had, and um, it may not be 100% true to style, but, uh, you know, I can't really go out and get new stuff, so I'm just going to... Uh, make do with what we have here. So all of these grains are actually left over from previous batches that I've made and I ordered all those grains from Northern Brewer so still big thank you to Northern Brewer again for providing the ingredients for this batch. Check them out if you haven't. Uh, they're great people, great store, great place to go get equipment, ingredients, and knowledge. So for our recipe it's pretty simple. Uh, so I'm gonna be using first of all a uh, combination of Munich light and Munich dark malts. So all of my malts are from Weyermann and I'm starting out with seven pounds of dark Munich and then we're gonna add four pounds of light Munich to that. We're gonna add two pounds of Pilsner malt to it and half a pound of Kara Munich and a quarter pound of Carafa two. Um, it's not labeled but I think my Kara Munich is all Kara Munich one. Um, and yeah, I'm adding a little bit of Pilsner in there because I learned this lesson with my Schwartz beer. Um, if you have a little too much Munich in there, it's just going to turn it very bready and full. Um, and it's not quite going to have the same lightness that you should expect from a lager. Even though this is a 6% plus lager, it should still have um, some lightness to it. And I think by adding a little bit of Pilsner to cut down on all the overall breadiness, that's going to help us. But overall, this should get us a nice dark brown colored beer. Um, and it should give us a lot of nice, pleasant, rich maltiness. Uh, so a little bit of kind of toffee caramel flavors in there, uh, some nice sweetness, but an important characteristic of this beer is going to be a Maillard character, uh, which is that deep, rich maltiness that you get from typically a decoction mash. I'm not doing a decoction mash in my current state, so we're going to rely on an ultra long boil to do it. So I'm going to boil this for two hours, um, and that extra that time in the kettle at those temperatures really does help bump up that melanoid in character and get us some nice richness. Uh, so for hops, I'm going to be adding a half an ounce of Magnum at 90 minutes just to get us um, just about 20 IBUs. Um, this is a decidedly malt forward beer uh, and it's Magnum is the cleanest bittering hop there is from German beers. So we're going to go with that. Uh, so for the yeast in this one, we'll be using Y Yeast 2206 Bavarian Lager. This is the same exact yeast that I used to ferment my Vienna Lager and my Schwartz beer. And uh, in fact, I harvested the yeast off of my Vienna Lager twice. So I have uh, one batch of it that I used for my Schwartz beer and the other batch is going to be used today. Uh, I kept it in the fridge in a mason jar for this very reason. Uh, so I have built up a big starter of that and that's what's going to go into this beer. So for our water profile, we're going to be doing a somewhat balanced uh, water profile, relatively minerally though, uh, has a little bit of bias towards the chlorides and um, is geared towards an amber beer. So we're looking at 44 parts per million of calcium, 10 parts per million of magnesium, uh, 44 parts per million of sodium, 
104 parts per million of chloride, 57 parts per million of sulfate, and 47 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that profile, I will be adding one gram of gypsum, three grams of epsom, two grams of sodium chloride, four grams of calcium chloride, and two grams of baking soda to the mash water uh, to get it up, all up to that water profile. Um, we are mashing at 152 degrees for 60 minutes, single infusion mash. So as you can see, it's a relatively simple and straightforward recipe, but making the beer good all comes down to with the process and uh, how well we do during the brew day. So we're gonna focus on that now. We're, all the water is up to temperature, so we're gonna go ahead and mash right in. I added eight gallons of distilled water to my claw hammer supply 120 volt system and started to heat it up to mash temperature. While I was heating, I measured out all of my water salts and I added them to the strike water and I also milled my grain. Once the water had reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with the grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash. Next, I started recirculating. I let the mash sit at 152 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 minutes, but 10 minutes in I took a pH reading and I saw an on-target pH of 5.2. Once the mash had sat for 45 minutes, I raised to the mash out temperature of 170. I let it sit there for 15 minutes and then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for 15 more minutes. I fired up the controller to 100% power at this time. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading, and I saw a measurement of 13.5 bricks, or 1053, which was one point lower than the target pre-boil gravity. Once I reached the boil, I did nothing for 30 minutes. Once 30 minutes had elapsed, I added my half ounce of magnum to bitter, and then an hour and 15 minutes later, I added a Rolflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. I let the boil continue for 15 more minutes, and then I ended the boil by starting to recirculate boiling wort through the chiller and the pump, which is, in my opinion, just the easiest and best way to ensure everything's all sanitary. After being ensured that the inside of the chiller and the pump are all sterilized, I began to chill to 70 or so degrees Fahrenheit. I took an OG sample at this time, and I recorded an original gravity of 17 bricks, or about 1068, which was actually two points higher than the target OG. I aerated with pure oxygen for about a minute and then I pitched my yeast and left it to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, first of all, I'm not doing it traditionally. So what I'm going to do is pressure ferment this thing. So what I'm going to do is throw it in my Spike CF5 back here, uh, clamp down that lid, clamp down everything, and uh, throw a spunding valve on top, and uh, apply about 5 to 10 psi of pressure, probably 10 psi, uh, and let it maintain that 10 psi of pressure at room temperature for about probably a week. Uh, that is going to be a quick fermentation. The added pressure is going to help eliminate uh, a good amount of the off flavors that are created by yeast fermenting outside of its uh, intended temperature range. And uh, typically with a lager, if you ferment it up in the mid 70s, if you're using a yeast like this one, you're going to create uh, a large amount of fusel alcohols and some very, very unpleasant flavors. All of which either need a lot of time or some added care to go away, or in some of which may not go away at all. So by adding that pressure, we eliminate that whole thing. We also have the added bonus of a faster fermentation. Um, that should all take about a week, but we still are gonna need to uh, lager the beer or clarify it and get it uh, you know, as crisp as possible. So the only way to get it super crisp is to put it in cold storage for a long time. But we can really aid the process by adding in some cold side fining. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add in uh, a two-stage fining agent called Super Clear. Um, and basically one stage goes in before you keg and the other stage goes in after you keg. And each fining agent attracts a different charged particle which allows you to strip all of the yeast, proteins, um, and other haze creating particles out of the beer uh, and leave you with a brilliantly clear beer much much faster than if you just stuck it in a lagering chamber or a bright tank for like a month or two. A stronger lager especially like this one is going to require more time to traditionally lager out. Uh, however, we are saving ourselves a good amount of time by adding that, that cold side fining agent. I also add whirlflock during the boil, 
uh, to help out with this as well. However, you're still going to need some extra time to get that true crisp lager character. Um, you can get something similar to it in a week or two, uh, but it really needs maybe a little bit more of three or four weeks to really get that full crispness. Um, I'm still technically taking my, my content break right now, so I will have plenty of time for this to sit and develop character um, after I keg it and after I clarify it. Uh, so hopefully I can get it to you guys in probably four or five weeks and we'll see what that looks like. Uh, but otherwise, there's other ways to make the beer. Uh, first of all, you can use Lutra Kvike. Uh, that is a great option for high temperature fermentations uh, and it will give you a lager-like beer. It's very similar to pretty much every lager yeast, but I like to use certain lager yeasts because they add different character. Lutra is a squeaky clean fermenter uh, and you will get zero yeast character in your beer whatsoever. Why yeast 2206, the Bavarian lager tends to leave a little bit of residual maltiness and fullness that I really like in the southern German lagers. Um, so that is why I'm using that as opposed to something like Lutra or W3470. So another option is Fermentis Saf Lager W3470, which is a dry lager yeast. It's a fantastic yeast that I've used many, many times, uh, and I have fermented with it more often than not on the warm side. So I can get this yeast to go all the way up to 65 degrees without any added fruitiness or off flavors. Uh, and it tends to attenuate pretty well, um, although in a beer like this it probably wouldn't be too bad because we have a decent amount of uh, residual sweetness that's going to come out of this one. That's both due to the mash temperature and due to the large amount of darker malts that we have in the beer. Uh, Munich is not going to get as dry as something like Pilsner. W3470 is always a great standby for most lagers, um, and I think in this case it would do pretty well for this beer. Of course, you can make something similar to this in a pseudo lager form um, with either Lutra or with another clean fermenting ale yeast. Um, something as simple as USO5 when fermented properly can be clean, um, as well as something like the California lager strain is always a good option, or the German ale strain, YS1007. That's gonna get you a very similar characteristic to a German lager, um, actually, and it has that same kind of residual maltiness left over, but attenuates pretty well. So, um, you have a lot of options for these beers, and uh, as long as you leverage your temperature and your fermentation conditions properly, it's gonna get you a very similar result in every case. So in a nutshell, I'll be fermenting this one around room temperature, which is about the, uh, it's about 72 degrees, and I'll be fermenting it under pressure with about 10 PSI of added pressure uh, throughout the entire fermentation, and uh, it'll probably take only about a week at that temperature. Um, it'll go quickly, I'll uh, transfer it to a keg, and I will add my cold side findings where appropriate, and I'll let it lager in my kegerator probably for about four weeks, um, or whenever I feel like putting content back on YouTube. Uh, then I'll put it back up. So uh, I'm hoping it turns out pretty well. It's a great beer to brew and um, Yeah, should be fun. So I will catch you guys in a few weeks Final gravity is coming in at about 1018 so um, that is at the upper bounds of the BJCP guidelines But actually still gets us right where we need to be so not too bad. So I'm definitely feeling much, much better now. Uh, luckily, my symptoms were not too bad, so that's all good. So the pressure fermentation went off without a hitch. It was very quick, it was about a week or so, um, and my Spike CO5 actually held pressure this time. So big shout out to whoever it was that told me to take that lid gasket and flip it upside down. So the beveled edge was actually resting against the fermenter side and not the lid side. Um, I had automatically thought that the other way around was how you installed it, and I had pressure leak issues, but the second I flipped it upside down and tightened it down I had no pressure escaping so if you are using the spike CFI to pressure ferment with then um, I would highly recommend making sure that your gasket is set up like mine is now um, it does make a pretty solid difference so I brewed this beer way back during the holidays uh, and now it is the last week of January and it's time to taste it it's been sitting in cold storage lagering out ever since then it's really had a lot of time to sit there and crisp up and, and just kind of get some more complex flavors coming out of it. And no doubt it will continue to develop character as it ages. But now is a good time, I think, for us to actually taste it. Today I'll be going outside for the tasting because it's not too cold today. Uh, so we're going to chance it and hopefully I can uh, get through it without freezing my head off. So the beer is called Johann Sebastian Bach, and it comes in at 6.8% ABV and 20 IBUs. Mm -hmm. 
the appearance of the beer is really nice. It's a solid dark uh, ruby red. Um, so if it's not clear, it's going to look brown. But when it's clarified, it's a really nice shade of rich red, um, which I really find myself enjoying. Pours with a sort of tannish, creamish, off-white head. It doesn't have too much lacing, unfortunately. Uh, it does kind of settle relatively quickly, though. I kind of wish it would stick around a little bit more readily, but that's all good. So now we'll go in for aroma. So the aroma is all malt, um, and I'm getting mostly like molasses and like a kind of semi-sugary barley malt. Um, no berry, no yeast or anything like that. No hops, so no herbal spice or anything like that. All just malt, smells sweet. Um, so yeah, uh, not too complicated on the aroma either. So now we'll go in for uh, mouthfeel. It's got a nice crisp, clean mouthfeel, um, but it's a bit more in the medium body. You know, it's a, it's a mid 6% beer, so you can feel that um, in the mouthfeel. It definitely has that effect. It's a little bit minerally too. It has a good lager mouthfeel though. It's very crisp, very clean. Um, not much there uh, in terms of the mouthfeel, but there is a little bit of that kind of middle um, puffiness. Uh, it's kind of think, I think that's kind of coming from all of the Munich malts. And that is also coming from the fact that the lager yeast that I decided to use, the 2206 uh, Bavarian lager, does leave a decent amount of maltiness behind. And um, that's definitely on display here. That being said, even though it had a very similar finishing gravity to the coffee stout that I just made, um, it has nowhere near the same mouthfeel. That is a very full beer. Um, this is much less so. And so now, let's go ahead and talk about flavor. This is um, honestly not as sweet as it smells. It's got a little bit more bitterness, um, which is manifesting itself in kind of like a toasty way uh, than I expected. Um, and I kind of wish there was a little bit more of a caramel character in here. It is in there, there's definitely flavor in terms of caramel, but it's definitely not at the same level as something like the Iron Gerbach, which is something that I really, you know, love to drink. Um, so what it has mostly at first is just kind of like a little bit of like a victory malt character, even though I didn't use victory malt. I think that might be the Carafa. Um, I might have put a little too much in possibly. Uh, so it has a little bit of that kind of dry, almost roasty character, like a brown malt, um, but not quite roast. On top of that, it's also very earthy, um, <laughs> which is an interesting character. Um, I kind of was hoping for more of like a caramel toffee character, which is in this still to a degree, but it's not really the main character here. Mostly just kind of like an earthiness and a full, full breadiness. This is tasting very similar to the Vienna Lager that I made a couple months ago, um, just at a higher percentage ABV. It's extremely similar in terms of the recipe too, so I really shouldn't be surprised, but uh, a lot more bready and biscuity than it is caramely and molasses-like. So, didn't quite hit the mark in terms of what I was wanting, um, but again, remember, I was working with the ingredients that I had on hand. Nonetheless, though, it is a very drinkable, very enjoyable beer, um, and for being a mid ABV beer, it works very well for colder days like this one, and um, just some nicer, you know, semi-sessionable types of beers. So as far as things that I think I can improve on this one, first of all, I think it needs an aroma hop. Um, it's not as complex uh, as I wanted it to be, and I think having something like an ounce of Hallertau at five minutes or an ounce of Saz at five minutes would be uh, a really nice addition for this, just to give it another layer of flavor of some kind. Um, just either that herbal or that spicy flavor would be really nice um, in this particular beer. Another thing I would change in this is either adding another quarter pound of Karamunic 1 or just swapping the whole thing out to maybe a Karamunic 2 or maybe a dash of Karamunic 3 just to get that extra little bit of molasses-like caramel character in here that you come to expect when you drink a bog. Um, and lastly, I would definitely reduce the amount of overall Munich 2. That malt is delicious and it's definitely got a place in this beer, but it, I think I used too much. It's just a little too bready, a little too thick. Um, so I think reducing the amount of Munich 2 would really help a lot. Anyway guys, I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. And if you're watching this two weeks from now, 
Tomorrow, we are about to get hit with an epic snowstorm here in New England, and I'm going to brew a stout in the middle of it, so we're expecting over two feet of snow, uh, and we're going to see how well the brew system uh, handles that while I make my Irish stout. Uh, should be a lot of fun. So if you're watching this two weeks from now, check out that video. It should be published by now. Otherwise, thank you for watching, guys. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt from my merchandise store down below the description box. You can get a whole bunch of different designs down there that hopefully you'll enjoy wearing, and you can help support my channel in the process. Secondly, I have a Patreon, which is linked down below the description box, so please check that out if you're interested in, in that. Um, big thank you to my Patreon supporters, though, for driving the production behind this channel. You guys do make a big difference for me. If you're also interested, I have an Amazon store which has a whole bunch of equipment that I highly recommend, stuff that I've used for a long time and actually fully endorse. And if you're interested in following me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer, where you can find slightly more frequent content updates uh, if that's your thing. Feel free to follow me there. And if you are still here, big thank you to you for sticking around to the end of the video. It does mean a lot to me, and I do appreciate it. So, until the next one, cheers.